Now, at the base of any good fundamental analysis is basic ratio analysis. Now, what I've got on your computer screen is a uh, income statement over here. I start with my revenues and I subtract my gross, uh, my um, first direct cost. I have gross profit, then my indirect cost, and now I have my earnings before. I pay my depreciation, amortization, interest, and taxes, sometimes referred to as your EBITDA. Down here, this is earnings before I pay my interest and taxes, and this is earnings before I pay my taxes. And really, that's all an income statement is, is um, just revenues minus expenses and bottom line. Over here is your balance sheet. On top of the balance sheet, this part of the balance is assets, and these are all my current assets. The line now divides my current from my long-term assets. Here's my liabilities, current liabilities, long-term liabilities. And if we take a look, I went ahead and put some numbers a little small here, but I've got $100,000 in revenue, and I have numbers down through here. And then I have assigned numbers here for the balance sheet. And let's take a look. If that's 100000 equals 50 plus 50, 50, 50 is 100. So my balance sheet does balance. So let's go ahead and start and do some ratios. Let's start with the first two, which sometimes I refer to them as, oops, uh, I refer to them as your solvency or liquidity ratios. The first one is your current ratio. Now, your current ratio comes over here to the balance sheet and looks at your current liabilities and your current assets. Now remember, these are this is our working capital. And what I'm doing is I'm going to divide my current assets by my current liability. So and I look here, I've got looks like twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars here in assets and thirty thousand dollars in liability. So if I take the thirty the fifty thousand dollars Divided by the $30,000, I'll get the current, and I believe I did the math right, that's about 1.67. So since the number is greater than 1, it tells me I have more current assets than I do liabilities. Is this good or bad? Well, it depends. It depends on what makes up the $50,000, what type of firm this is. Let's go to the next one, the quick ratio, and I'll give a little example here. The quick ratio looks at all the current assets except the least liquid which is inventory. Uh, inventory is at the bottom which means as I work my way down they become less liquid. So if I remove this twenty thousand dollars now I have thirty thousand instead of fifty thousand divided by thirty thousand. So now my quick ratio is one times where I have one times as many, the exact amount of assets current the liabilities once I remove my inventory. Now what do these numbers mean the 1.67 and the 1? Is that good or bad? Well again it depends. If you were to look at like a jeweler you're going to find that their current ratio could be as high as 3 or 4. You remove their inventory and it can drop below 1 because a jewelry store has lots of inventory it's small, it's worth a lot of money, and it can be affected by an economic downturn. Whereas a car manufacturer wouldn't have as much inventory because they have to pay for somebody to watch it. So they have uh, they practice more of a just-in-time inventory type system. So again, you have to take these numbers and compare them to like firms. So I'm going to put a line right here. and Let's go to the next section. The next section is asset management. So I'm going to start with days, sales, outstanding, or sometimes referred to as action average collection period. Now what these next ratios through here are going to be looking at is how well management is managing our assets, our assets that drive our revenues. Uh, so let's look at the first one, the days sales outstanding or average collection period just takes your accounts receivable, which in this case is twenty thousand dollars, twenty K, and divide by the average daily sales, which is nothing more than taking your total revenue which in this case is a hundred thousand. Let's put the K there, and I got to divide that by the number of days in the year. And I'm gonna put 365. Sometimes I use 360, 365, and I've got to do this number first. And I think I get like 274. If I divide that into my accounts receivable, I should get around 71.99 or 72 days. That's quite a long time to get paid or convert your uh, accounts receivable over. So uh, we'll come back to that one. Let's look at some other management ones. We call them turnover. So I'm going to put TO. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look how well, uh, based on our revenues, we are managing our assets. And we usually look at maybe inventory fixed and total. So here's inventory, here's fixed, and here's total. So if I put inventory and I start with looking at sales, and I'll put sales on top. So this would be my inventory, and this would be my fixed. And this is my total. 
I'm going to put the 100K on top of each one of these things, and I'm going to divide it by each one of those sections. So inventory is 20,000, 20K. So I turn it over five times. My fixed is 50, so I utilize my fixed assets twice. And then my total is one. Now, what do these numbers mean in conjunction with the day sales outstanding? Well, again, it depends. I like to compare these to a like firm. For instance, this was Home Depot. I'm going to compare it to Lowe's. If it's McDonald's, I may compare it to um, uh, KFC or Yum or some other like firm. So I can see how well a very similar firm is managing their day sales outstanding. Um, for instance, th this number could be quite extreme with healthcare companies because of the reimbursement schedule. So I may compare a healthcare company with another healthcare. I wouldn't compare it to like a McDonald's or something of that nature. Same here with our turnover ratios. This is how we calculate them. The calculation is the easy part. It's is that number good or bad is the more difficult part. Let's go to the next section. Something I refer to as the debt ratios. Now, some companies don't have debt, therefore they will not have debt ratios. If they have no debt, this number here would be zero, and assets would equal owner's equity. There would be no interest payment here either. So we're going to look at two of them. We're going to look at our total debt, which is we have 50K in total debt. We're going to divide by the total assets, which is 100K. So we can see that 50 cents of every dollar is owed in debt. So our ratio is 50%. Let's do one more and then discuss them. Let's look at... I'm going to refer to it as times interest earned. What I tend to do here is I go to right here where my interest payment is and right here my earnings. Well, I earn $20,000 and I have to pay $5,000 in interest. So what I normally do is I take my $20,000 and I divide it by the $5,000 and I see that it's four times. Or if this number here declines by more than four times, I can't pay my interest payment. That's a very interesting one when we're looking at it from the standpoint of a homeowner. If you were to determine how much interest you pay on the first year home loan and compare that to how much money you make, it could be quite interesting because uh, most of your interest is paid up front. So your tie for your first year home mortgage for a lot of people could be a very low number. The higher the better. Let's go look at this debt ratio. Is this good or bad? Well, it depends on the firm. If I were to look at a firm that can withstand economic downturn, like maybe a tobacco or alcohol, uh, knowing they can make their interest payment every year because people, just because the economy turns down, they don't stop drinking and smoking, this number may be closer to 75%. Now, if I look at Disney, uh, Disney could be affected by economic downturn. So this number in Disney is probably closer to 25 cents of every dollar because they know that if the economy turns sour uh, and they have a couple years of down times, they may have to borrow from cash to pay their interest payments and they would rather not do that. They want to keep that cash for new programs and new um, parks and things of that nature. Uh, let's look at a, another category called the profitability category. Now I'm going to start with uh, just looking at, as we work our way down here, I'm going to look at gross profit. And I'm going to look at net profit. Now I can look at each level. What I mean by that, every time I step on the next stair, I can look back and see how much I kept at this part here. For instance, I had 100000 in sales. 50,000 went in direct cost, cost of goods sold or manufactured, leaving me 50,000. So my gross profit tells me for every dollar, 50 cents made it here. And how I did that was I just took my 50K, divided by my sales, and I get 50% or 50 cents of every dollar. Is that good or bad? Well, it, again, I'm going to compare that to a like industry to see if, if I'm working in an industry that's very similar. Are they managing their direct cost as well as me or am I doing a better job or am I not doing a better job? Net profit just looks at the bottom line. Like I said, you can look at any one of these levels. Generally, I just look at the top one and, or the first one here to see how well um, my cost are behaving or misbehaving here. Some people go here to get an idea of both their direct and indirect. And I'm going to shoot down to the bottom. How much actually made it? Well, you can see $10,000 made it. 100000 in sales. So it should jump out at you that 10% made it to the bottom line, or 10 cents of every dollar. Now that's a pretty decent return for some companies. Some companies may be higher to 
20, 30%. One thing you always have to remember here, these are accounting numbers. See, if we look closely, depreciation was $5,000. So technically speaking, I didn't pay depreciation. So it's actually a 15% return. So uh, I tell students sometimes to go over the cash flow statement and look at the cash flow from operations and see your largest cash. It could be depreciation. Uh, some of your companies that have a lot of equipment, that is a really large number. Uh, let's look at a few more ratios here. Let's look at ROA and ROE. And again, remember, these are accounting ratios. Now, ROA is the amount that I returned based on all of my assets, hence return assets. So I returned, in essence, 10K. In essence, I have 100K of assets, so I returned 10% for that accounting period. And this is generally uh, would be a one period, maybe a quarter. And this is our permanent equation. So uh, this doesn't change. Well, we add to it, but it never goes back to zero. ROE is the same thing, except instead of using A, we use E. So I'll use the same 10K for the R return. And now for the E, it's half of that because the other half is in debt. So now it actually increases. I always tell people, be careful with this ROE. One, it's at the counting equation. Two, it doesn't take in any consideration risk. And three, it doesn't look to see the amount of money I might be putting into maybe a couple different ideas. And just because, you know, one may be a million dollars, one is $50,000, and one may have a little higher, but the one that a million may be a little lower, but it's going to retain a lot more cash. So, again, later lectures I'll look at that, but right now we'll just say that that ROE is 20%. I return 20% of all my equity. The only way these two numbers would ever be equal is if the company had no debt. And refer to the DuPont analysis because the DuPont analysis is just another way of looking at these two ratios or decomposing and looking to their parts. Finally, let's look at maybe, uh, let's look at some uh, ratios like PE ratio. P stands for the price and E stands for the earnings. So I did not give you the price. So let me go ahead and give a price. Let's say this company is currently selling for $15 on the stock market. Now we uh, see we have a P, but we still don't have the E. Well, the E would be the earnings per share. So here's our earnings. And let's say there are 10,000 shares outstanding. So for every share they earned a dollar, 10,000 shares, $10,000. That particular quarter, the earnings per share was a dollar. If I divide that into the 15, I get a P ratio of 15 times. Or the company is selling for 15 times more than what it earned that quarter. Good or bad? Well, the average S&P stock is probably closer to 1670, depending on the economic conditions. So it could be this stock's a little undervalued. Maybe this should be a little higher. Or perhaps uh, you'll have a P ratio of close to 100 because we're anticipating this lower number to eventually increase. So and be careful. It just gives me an indication that the company is selling at 15 times earnings. Finally, let's look at something I'm referred to as market to book. Now, we know what the market price is. It's $15. That's what the stock market, that's what investors feel it's worth. They feel it's worth $15. Now, what does an accountant think it's worth? Well, let's say the book value based on account is $5, and the stock market thinks it's worth $15. So you can see the stock market thinks it's worth three times more than the accountants. Why is that? Well, I always tell students, this number doesn't change that much. Therefore, if you're looking for undervalued stock, you're looking for a company that's going to make a lot more money than we thought they were going to make, or something on these assets may be undervalued. For instance, maybe this plant and equipment is undervalued. Maybe we purchased a lot of land at a historic price that's worth more. So this is what we're looking at. Maybe this account, these uh, these uh, investors here feel that the assets are undervalued by three times, therefore driving the price up. I don't know. I don't really know. I'm just using this as an example. But this particular company is worth three times. If it's less than one, it tells me an accountant thinks it's worth more than the market. If it's greater than one, the market feels it's worth more than 
what the uh, accountants think it's worth. So uh, I hope this helps a little bit. And that is some basic ratio analysis, doing the liquidity or solvency ratios, looking at some how well management is managing their assets, how well or how much debt the company has, and looking at some profit margins and ROA and ROE, and finally looking at P-E ratio and market-to-book ratios. But remember, it's always based upon the company you're comparing it to. So always compare apples to apples or like companies to like companies.